lot of um, really boring like stuff, I'm sorry, but also really important stuff uh, that we didn't know about before we started this game room, so it's good to know. Um, but I'll start it off with the thing. outside of this class for our second class at Scare LA next week. Uh, and the big thing about the financial information too is that again, your experience is going to be different. So even if I did tell you what our finances were, it wouldn't help you at all because it's gonna be completely different for you. Um, so uh, a little bit about us and how we got started. Uh, yeah, so um, we both come from a theater background. Um, I was a set designer, scenic painter. Luke here is a scenic carpenter and um, tech director. So together we're able to really just bring something to escape rooms that I think a lot of people might not have. That's one of the reasons why we got into this business is we went to some escape rooms that were really low in the scenic level. And I'm not too sure if some of you have experienced that. And we saw the potential there. We're like, guys, this is theater, but without having to deal with like I'm a queen actor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's what made us do it, because we're like, this is something that we can bring to the table. We can kind of up the production value that we see. So we opened Crossroads Escape Games in early 2016. Um, we started the production of it at in 2015, in January, mm -hmm. February. So it took an entire year to actually get to the point where we opened our doors and we had our first customer. Uh, so the reason that we're doing this panel, uh, she touched on it a little bit, is that uh, we love uh, escape rooms, yep. um, and uh, we've done 150 together. Yes, well, yeah. a little over. Yeah, you're a little over 150. Uh, you're 150. I'm 150. 150 more. Yeah, 150. <laughs> <laughs> All in the Southern California area, which leads me uh, to my other point why we're doing this. There are a lot of escape rooms out there, uh, and a lot. It started to be like kind of a quick cash grab kind of thing. That boat has sailed. It's not that anymore, uh, so I don't recommend going that route. Um, it's kind of a pretty big investment now. Um, uh, yeah, so we encourage you to think outside the box and bring something new to the table if you're going to do this. 
Um, and we'll go over a little bit more of that later as well. A lot of people have approached us and been like, well, why are you doing this? Like, why are you creating more competition for yourself by giving people all these pointers on how to open up an escape room? And we honestly don't see other escape rooms as competition. We see it as like a really great community where we can recommend one another. Because you can't really play the escape room twice. Like, maybe twice. But more than that, that's kind of weird. So we really like recommending other great escape rooms. Our problem is though, there's not a lot of great escape rooms to recommend. So we, if you're going to open an escape room, we want it to be great. So we want to give you the tools that you need to make it great, so there's more enthusiasts out there. Because our biggest... Compared to the number of escape rooms that yes. exist. Yeah. There are lots of great games out there. <laughs> but compared to the number that exists, The majority are, I think, below what the standard should be. Uh, and what it's doing is it's making people play an escape room for their first time, and they hate it. They're like, that was okay. I'm, I'm done. No more of those. Did it. Checked it off the list. Never need to do an escape room again. And that's not what we want. We want more enthusiasts. We want someone to do an escape room and go, that was amazing. Now I want to escape from a spaceship. Or, you know, just the next thing. So we want you guys to do that, to make the next thing. Not just another office or a jail or something that's already out there. And to be successful. Yes. Did you So I come from. Yeah. Um, so you don't know I pulled this up. But this is actually um, something that I read this morning. It was posted today from Room Escape Artists, which is actually a review site um, of just you know two enthusiasts who played, I think, over 300 rooms together. Um, and they recently just did this graph today. So I'm like, oh, this would be a really good show. Um, the, Popularity in escape rooms is rising drastically. And one thing that they mention here is that the quality will also have to rise as more start to drop. Uh, right now there is 120 escape rooms in SoCal. 60 of those are roughly in um, Los Angeles area. 30 of them are in Orange County, and 30 of them are in um, San Diego. So those are just companies. Some companies have multiple locations, and each of those companies have you know, probably three to five games, I would say is the average. So there's a lot out there already. So just be aware of what's there and that everyone's always looking to improve what they have. We've played 150 games and we have not played at all of the companies uh, in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And we've only played in Southern California. Well, because some have closed since then yeah. and then some have some started that we haven't played. Yeah, it's, it's a, a lot. Pretty big mark. We played 150 games on companies. We've played like 70. Right. Okay. Not all the companies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, we don't have to put this here if you think it's scary. Uh, but definitely, this is a great <laughs> article to read, um, Roomscape Artists. They also have some really great critiques in each of the games they review. One thing I love about them is they don't give it a star rating. They don't go like, oh, this escape room is five stars, because they change every year. Something that was five stars last year might not be this year. Uh, so they just kind of always give like a shortcomings area to it. It's like, this is what I think this escape room can improve upon. And it's, it's nice. It's refreshing. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, kind of going back to the handout I gave you guys. So beginning steps. Um, these are the baby steps that we had no idea how to open the escape room when we first started. Um, and it was a lot of researching online and figuring out what your first steps are. Your first one's going to be to become a business entity, whether that's an S Corp, LLC, C Corp. Um, that's totally up to you guys, which one you want to be. I'll let you know that we are a C Corp. The reason why is because my accountant told me to. I have another information. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so to become a corporation, a lot of people might say, like, oh, you need to go to legal Zoom or something like that. Um, that's not necessary. You can really just. Um, you can do it yourself. It's just an articles and corporation sheet, one-sided sheet, super easy to do. Uh, and that will just give you your, your business entity. That's what's going to be taking in all the money, and that's what's going to save you if you're ever sued. First step. Um, next is to find a location. This is really hard. This took us six months, mostly because at the time, no one knew where an escape room was. Um, funny stories. We, for a long time, people thought we were like a sex dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> and then we showed them a video of it, and they're like, thank you so much for doing so, uh, Yeah, so people, when you say that you're going to lock someone in a room, they're going to say, no, thank you. That's, that sounds like a liability. You know, they want a, a dry cleaner 
or a deli, something that they're familiar with, same thing mm. with the city. Once you start saying that it's this new kind of entertainment where we lock people in a room and they solve puzzles, you're like, no, 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 that, that's okay. So choose your words carefully <laughs> and to be as specific as possible so they don't start thinking it's something else. Yes. Uh, one good way to explain um, your escape room to the city is as a sort of class. Uh, they know what classes are, like karate classes and dance classes and stuff like that. Uh, describe it as a class. You sign up for a time period. You go and you do the class at that time period. Only so many people and then can be in the class. Yes, yeah, it's not Disneyland where everybody and anybody is coming whenever they want. Uh, it's a select group of people at a select group of time. Uh, explain it as a class, a type of class, and that will make sense to them. Yes. Something I learned the hard way. <laughs> Um, for finding your location, there are pros and cons to a lot. Uh, one of it's just going to be who can take you. Uh, true story, the only reason why we are where we are is because they're the only place that said yes after six months of searching. Luckily, we like it, but we were desperate. We would take anything. Um, you can choose between a commercial property, an industrial property, and a business park. All of those have pros and cons. Um, a commercial property will probably cost you much more rent. And I also want to say watch out for triple nets. It's kind of like this additional rent that they'll charge you times three. To trim the hedges. Yes. So it could be like, oh, and your net is 500, but it's a triple net, so it's actually an additional 1,500 a month. So watch mm -hmm. out for those fine prints because that it definitely deterred us from a few locations. If you have a commercial property, you'll probably have an easier time with permits just because it will allow you to have more parking. So you have that pro con like, Okay, cool, less time working with permits, but higher rent cost. So it's up to you to decide. An industrial space, space, which is what we really wanted, is allows you to build your own sets. Uh, we have the hex room, which is what you saw here. It has a very unique design where there's actually a hexagon room. We realized that's not something we're going to find anywhere, that we had to build it ourselves. <laughs> so we were like, we have to have an industrial property. We have to be able to build these sets from the ground up and not use spaces that are already pre-built. Uh, so that was awesome, like having an industrial space because we can make something really unique. The problem is though, then you go through a lot more permits because it's mostly for, um, you know, manufacturers and stuff, the zoning's gonna be different. You're gonna get a conditional use permit, which we'll talk about later, uh, and your parking might be limited. So again, and then the last one is a business park, which we've seen a lot of escape rooms in. I'm, I'm sure you guys have too. It has the cheapest rent and a limited amount of space. Um, and you don't have any street exposure, which right now I think that's getting more and more popular with escape rooms, because people are driving by and going like, oh, that's that thing my friend talked about. Even if it's not the same company, they're like, that's the thing, and they'll just go to the one they see. Um, but it is the cheapest, and if you're kind of nervous about this business venture and where it's gonna go, a lot of people do prefer going a cheaper route, seeing how it works out for them, and then expanding into a bigger location. Um, again, your choice. Looking back on it now for us, we wish that we went bigger first. Yeah. We, we did try to play kind of in the middle for us, but now we're kind of running out of space. And we don't <laughs> want to go through this whole process again. <laughs> <laughs> um, next is to talk to your city to see what they require. So you find a space, you have a person who's like, okay, yeah, I'll take an escape room. Um, now go to your city and see how hard it's going to be to actually make this work. Some cities might just say, absolutely not. We don't want this type of business. Um, it might be zoned as something that you cannot have an escape from there or any kind of like through traffic because uh, it might have like a blocked off parking area, who knows. Um, and then also the conditional use permit which might be a make or break for some of you if you want to go that route. Um, once you have it settled and the city doesn't seem too terrible, and to give you an idea on cities, they're all so different. Los Angeles doesn't really care too much about parking. I'm sure we all recognize that. <laughs> um, Anaheim, where we are, cares so much about parking. Like, street parking does not count. You have to have actual parking spaces, and there was a point where they thought, since our space was 3,000 square feet, that we could fit hundreds of people at a time, so we had to build like, a parking structure that would cost millions of dollars, and we're like, this is going on. This is the way I can. <laughs> so be clear with what they mean. But the parking in Anaheim is great. It is. <laughs> um, and then there's other places like Irvine. I'm just talking about Orange County just because that's what we're most familiar with. Um, Irvine has actually, they know what an escape room is and they've realized they're not dangerous or scary. So they've created it 
as a class. There's now a form that you can fill out to become an escape room down there, and it's the fastest way possible. The problem with that, though, is they have a lot of business centers there, so you're limiting yourself as far as space. And they also have a lot of escape rooms already established down there, so you're already going into a pretty competitive market. To be able to be on the website, or on Google, when someone types in escape room in Irvine, if you're opening up two years after other, you know, 10 other businesses, it's going to be really hard to be on the top of that list. Um, the lease agreement, the only um, thing I want to tell you about is if you do need a conditional use permit, that is something that you have to, it's a whole process, you have to <laughs> have a location signed with your lease to then move on to the conditional use permit. During that time though, they can say no at any time, we don't want your business. In which case, you do not want to be stuck in a four year, two year lease agreement. So you need to have a clause in your lease saying, like after X amount of time, I can leave if this permit doesn't go through. I'm just saying that to save you guys, make sure that doesn't happen, because um, if you can't open the table and you have a perfect space, I don't know what you're gonna do. We've also heard of a couple cities that have just outright said no to all escape rooms. So you might be thinking, oh look, there's a dark spot here in escape rooms, nobody's there. That might be because they're not allowed to be there and you won't get in. Yes. Um, cities can be very, very stubborn. And just so. because there's an escape room in the city already <laughs> doesn't mean it will be easier for you. It might be harder because during your city hearing they might go, no, 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 we already have four of these, we don't want any more. Um, and then also just with the conditional use permit, it has to be done every single time. It's not like now that there's an escape room here, this process is easier. It's the same thing again and again. Even though we are in Anaheim and we've been here for a year and a half, we have done nothing to help other future escape room people open up their games. They yeah. have to start from the beginning. It's just as painful for them. There's been and there's nothing we can do about no it. No change. It's, it's the city. So, pool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are the first steps you need to know your location, um, be a business, and um, to know what you need in that location from your city. Um, now we're going to get into the permits. And I'm sorry, guys, this is going to be a little heartbreaking. This is the worst part. Like, I cried myself to sleep for months after <laughs> during this process. <laughs> um, the conditional use permit is a CUP. This is um, it's pretty important. Uh, I have the definition here of it, which I know kind of sounds like a bunch of hoopla. But if you read it very carefully, it does make sense. Um, basically, because we're in an uh, industrial zone location, it means that we don't have the proper uh, what so, is it? zoning or... Um, yeah, essentially what we're doing is we're using our space for something that it was not intended to be used for. There you go. Uh, and that's what CUPs are for. You want to use the space for this. Well, it wasn't initially intended for that, so you have to make sure that the building can accommodate that. Uh, even though we talked a little bit earlier, you can do a, um, um, what's the easier, uh, more expensive route? Commercial location. Oh, commercial. Thank you, commercial location. <laughs> uh, even though you do that, uh, don't feel like you're out of the woods. The city can just still drop a CUP on you because they are nervous about what you're doing. So it can get you around it. Uh, because of the parking situations and stuff like that, and because of fire sprinklers and all that, uh, commercial buildings have all of that's going to help you. But that doesn't mean you're out of the woods necessarily on, on the CUP. So. so the, oh. Um, one quick question sure. for the CUP. Is there a duration for that? Can they revoke it after time? Yeah. Um, yes and uh, yes, no. I will, I'll answer that <laughs> with a few other points. So um, CUP, it's process. You have your location, you have your lease sign, and then you go to the city and you're like, okay, CUP time. So it's very expensive. Um, it can cost anywhere between $3,000 to $25,000, depending on what city, which also you should take into account um, knowing what city you're getting into before all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is the price. Um, it can also take up to three to 12 months to actually get your public committee hearing in which they will approve. So the really horrible part of this whole thing is you have a lease agreement that you are now paying rent on. And you cannot do a single thing to that building until you have your CUP approved. So if that takes six months, you have to sit on a building for six months 
paying rent to then get a yes or no, oh and no care if she's moving forward or not. On it's top horrible. Of whatever charges That's why I cried myself to sleep. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it, it, <was> kidding. Because <laughs> just being in this limbo of not knowing and then just spending all this money that you've been saving up, and then you finally get the yes or no, and you're out of money. You're like, great. Well, how are we going to build this escape room? Uh, and it's also, it's kind of an up in the air of how long it's going to take. They usually give you like, oh, it's three to six months. Oh, it'll be six to 12 months. That, that's horrible. That's, that's a lot of time. Um, so, yes, yeah, so during that process, you're waiting around. Um, they will put together a presentation to give to the public city members. Um, and then they, you will go up and they'll ask you questions about it. And at that moment, they will say yes or no. They'll all vote on it if they want your business in their city and if they want your business at that location. So they might say no because of parking. They might say no because they don't want your business. Maybe there's too many escape rooms. I, there's no, I have no way to tell you yes or no. It's up to them. You said they will do the presentation. They do the presentation for they you. In that? The city people. And they so do a horrible job. The city, <laughs> city people. And then the city people vote up to them. Yes, you will describe what you want to do and what your business is. They put together they do the a PowerPoint, mm -hmm. uh, which is, in our case, was three pages. Three pages. It cost us $800. They, they break it down for you. Yeah. <laughs> it was a really expensive PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> and they, they, uh, bring that to the city council and the city council votes on, on it. Thank you. Another thing the CUP does though, it also does traffic reports. So that's really where the big chunk of this money goes into is knowing how many people are passing by your business a day and how many parking spots you really need. I don't know, Anaheim is really about parking, you can tell, but that, that was what killed us the most. Um, so a lot goes into it, um, but it is a lot of just waiting around. I'm sorry about that. Um, so at the city hearing process, you will get a yes or no, hopefully you get a yes, and then you can move into your next permit, which is building permits. These also take a really long time. Um, you need, after you get your CUP, then you can talk to an architect and a structural engineer to um, start making plans. And they will only accept things by a architect with a structural engineer stamp. Even if you guys are good at drafting or you know AutoCAD, it, you have to have that professional stamp on it. It will help translate your ideas to your architect if you do have these skills, but you will have to pay someone to do these things. Uh, and that's, that's a process as well, because they'll give you a draft, and then you have to go back to them and be like, these are things we need to change, and then they'll get around to making those changes, and then give you the draft again. This is all while you're still paying the rent. Provided this is if you plan on building yes. walls in your space. If you're using <coughs> existing walls, uh, you get a leg up on this. Yes. Uh, but if you plan on building a custom game, uh, you have to do building permits and yes. Uh, and then expect to go through a lot of revisions. Um, even though you have a professional drafted up and it's all good and they check all the rules and stuff, the city will find problems with it uh, and send it back. And it usually takes two weeks by the time you get it from your architect to the city. They get it reviewed and it comes back. Um, that's after your first, your first submission is like a five week waiting time or something like that. And then after that you get two week waiting times. Um, they s speed you up a little bit. And uh, I'll just tell you real quick, this process, um, it's very frustrating because you will give them this, this drawing. And they, two weeks later they'll give it back to you and be like, well, the square footage isn't on here. And you'll be like, what? Yes, it is. Like, why would my architect give you something that didn't have the square footage on it? So you bring it to him, you're like, somehow the square footage is missing in here. He goes, oh yeah. So he has to go and draw a circle around the square footage that was on the plans, initial it, and then you go back and you turn and you go, oh no, 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 it was on here, guys. And they're like, oh, okay, we'll get back to you in two weeks. And then you wait around and they find one more thing that's wrong with this. You're and it's, on it. it's horrible. It's, it's really <laughs> happened. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, 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 they made. They had us make changes, and then we came back, and they took away those changes, yeah, and made us change it back anymore. to where it was. Uh, my advice would be, if you can, to have your architect come in with you to the city, so that when they have these bogus claims that such and such is not in your plans, your architect is right there to say, "Oh, I know exactly where I put that in the plans. It's right here. Uh, don't worry about it." And then you can. But yeah, they'll still give you revisions over nonsense. Oh, so, I see a question in the back. What was that? Um, where's the line between, like, I am building a wall and I am nailing beams to the wall and it's non-structural? Is there a place where you can kind of get away? And uh, none of our walls.
walls are like structural. They're all temporary walls. They're not holding the ceiling up at all. But um, you still need a permit for them. Yeah, there's there's load bearing walls, there's bearing walls, and then there's just walls. You have walls with electrical in them. Uh, if you have low voltage, usually you don't have a problem. If you're going to put any kind of high voltage in your wall, then you have to get electrical permits and go through a whole other permitting process and all that. Um, so it depends on your wall. If it's not a wall, like, can you just be putting in set pieces? Set, like, set pieces are, are fine. Like yeah, furniture, pieces. all that stuff, totally fine. Usually We're talking you about if you need to take down a wall, you need demolition permits, and then you need the building permits to put that wall back in. And it's honestly, it's just the city trying to be safe, it's stopping fires from happening. Uh, unfortunately, the people who work there are just um, devoted to making your life horrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do talk to your city if you're doing a really light building. Uh, you can get what's called an over-the-counter approval, which is, uh, especially if you're doing like a little half wall or something, something minor. Uh, sometimes they'll just approve it over the counter and you can get kind of a, a same day or just a one week kind of quick thing. Uh, but different cities will have different policies on it. This process, if, let's say you're getting a, a 2,000 square foot in band foot in multiple games. Do you have to do that with each? Like if you're doing it by stages, like you only have the capital to do one game first but then you hope to open up the additional games. Mm -hmm. Is this a three-step process? Yes, you need to get building permits for each additional, anything that you build. So if you build, so if you're gonna do, uh, you have a big space and you wanna do six games, what I would recommend is that you plan out all six games and you build all of them at once, their exterior walls their in, and any interior walls that they need, uh, and then open your first one that you, you know, want to start with and then you can develop them as you go. But the walls themselves, uh, I would recommend doing it all at once. If you're not gonna do that, you wanna save money, that's fine too. But any additional game that you're gonna add that requires walls will need more building permits. And they'll come in, they'll do the whole thing, and so on. So what we did is, when we found out this process was so horrible, we really quick drafted up, like, well, we had a good idea of what we wanted the fun house to be, and we built both of those at the same time. So if one house was totally built, they were bare walls that were drywall with some mud on them, and then we didn't touch it until we had enough money to actually like put some paint in there and to put some props and stuff, but at least that process was done. Mm -hmm. And then we can just get to it when we needed to instead of having to wait on the city's time. Mm -hmm. um, when you're, so this is getting the permit to start building. Um, once you have your plans approved, um, the building inspectors will come in and you have to do this in stages. So you'll do like your framing first. Oh, okay. Yes, we're gonna do a Q and A at the very end, guys. Okay. Um, in 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're gonna do your framing first and then a framing inspector has to come in and he has to approve the framing and then next the drywall inspector will come in and approve the drywall. The thing that happens though is you do your framing and the inspector comes in and he says this is wrong. You cannot move forward on the rest of what's right with drywall until the framing inspector has said yes to all the framing. So it is a little bit of a waiting game there too. But Luke has a really good note to give. Yes, a little cheat uh, that my, my father taught me. Uh, he's a, he a foreman for many years. Um, you build out what you're gonna build, uh, and it's sometimes good to leave one brace off that you know that you need uh, or something that's not painfully obvious, but an inspector's going to catch. That way he comes in and he catches it, and he feels like he did his job, and mm -hmm. oh, your place is so safe, just remember to put that brace up, and I'll come by next time. So when he comes by next time, he sees it, and goes, oh, you fixed all my critiques, you wonderful person. I'm sure this place will be great. And um, yeah, you're good to go. Our problem is building <laughs> Laugh, it's real. Um, <laughs> my problem is building it perfect the first time, they have to find something wrong with it. And if it's something like, I don't know, for instance, if you, this is a story we heard, um, we nailed down all our boards um, and we built them on the floor and then we put them up. So you couldn't see that some two by fours were nailed from the bottom because now they're on the floor. So you had to pin nail every single one of those to show that there is a nail going through this board. To the bottom board. My grandfather had to do that when we built his house. Yes. So 
Give them something that's a really easy fix. Because there was no proof that the nails were in those boards. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that's building inspectors. Be so nice to them. Yes. Bring them donuts. They can make your life hell. Um, next is the fire inspection. Fire is a hit or miss with every city. Some of them might require you to put fire sprinklers in. Um, that could cost required emergency lights. Ours required emergency buttons that unlock the doors. If you've seen an escape room that has like an emergency key that you can use to unlock the door, that is not legal at all. Apparently, using a key is previous knowledge. That's and a building code from the state of California. Yes. A key requires previous knowledge. It is not a means of egress. Yes, you so have to be able to just push something to leave. Like yes. a hands if you look back device. there, you'll see those bars. If there's a fire in here, we all run, we push on the bars, and the doors split open for us. That's what it has to be. So that's what they wanted on all our doors. And I'm like, that doesn't work. If you put the the hex room, you'd know like being locked in your room is like what makes that feel so cool and getting the key out and all that. Um, so we were able to negotiate um, the buttons, the emergency exit buttons, and in our in Anaheim, the fire code is that they have to keep the doors unlocked for seven seconds. So when you press our emergency exit button, it actually unlocks every single door in that game, which is why we say it ends the game. Because once you press it, you can just like bump the door and it will open. And fire department loves low voltage stuff. If you can do what you want to do with low voltage, do it. Uh, because they love low voltage stuff. Uh, they won't bother yeah. um, I have a building background. I, I do restaurants and stuff, so I'm pretty familiar with this. Okay. One question that I have that I don't see you addressing is ADA issues. Because I played uh, the X Room, for instance, mm -hmm. and I see that you have ADA restrooms. That's perfect, and that was good. But when you go inside your actual room, for instance, uh, well, you really can. Um, oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. All of the uh, rooms are built to where a wheelchair can make a full oh, circle full in there. Circle? Um, okay. That was part of our design in there. Um, but with ADA, you just have to make it so if someone was a wheelchair the handicap, they had to they have to be able to experience somehow. Okay. So if we do get wheelchair players, we put them in the detective's role because it gives them the okay. most amount of room okay. to, to move. So they can still play the game. But they can't play us like, um, and also... <laughs> Spoilers! <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> it's like, we're walking a fine line here. Because there's carpet in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't tell them that. It's really secrets. Um, but that's actually a good point to bring up with the building permits as well. Once you are going to spend so much money to um, add these extra walls or do all this building to your space, the city also requires at least 20% of whatever you are putting into your building goes into making it ADA compliant or more ADA compliant. So that's why our bathrooms were a really easy thing to make ADA compliant because they were not before. They are actually stalls before. We had a huge you get dance party in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I would suggest if you can, you really should make everything ADA compliant because they do come and they have a right to play your games mm -hmm. as well. So. Do what you can to make it so you can um, somehow have them play your games. And they're going to be aware that there's going to be some areas that maybe have stairs that they can't go in, but don't just block that off completely for them to where the second half of the game can't be experienced. Uh, as far as ADA, uh, there are a lot of rules. Like a lot, a lot. Like enough to fill this room. Mm -hmm. To the point where nobody knows them all. <laughs> and to the point where businesses get sued by lawyers who know that. Uh, and just, well, they won't even walk into your space. They'll look at your business and they'll say, eh, there's probably something there. Sue you, you, they know that you're just gonna settle and they'll get your money. Uh, so, ADA, don't worry too much about it that you gotta comply with this room full of rules. Uh, do what you need to do to accommodate your guest who is gonna be in a wheelchair, right? You want them to have a good time at your business uh, as far as the lawsuits and stuff, they're probably going to come anyway. So don't feel like you have to spend millions of dollars complying with all this stuff. Just do what's going to what's necessary to make them comfortable and what your city and your architect are going to tell you that they need in order to navigate your space. And you should be fine. Uh, 
Once that is all done, then you will get your final sign off. Your inspector will come in and inspect everything. That's usually when they expect like the, the restrooms and stuff like that. And then you'll get signed off. Um, and then that is when you can get your business license and maybe even a seller's permit if you want to sell merchandise like t-shirts or side little puzzles and stuff like that. And then you can actually start creating your games. And that's when it gets really fun. <laughs> oh yeah, we're creating games. That's oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, you have to get the insurance um, the moment you get your lease signed. Uh, it's just a general liability insurance, and that's to help the landlord too. If someone got hurt while people were doing the construction and stuff, what do you get employees? Then you need insurance to cover them. Um, workers' health insurance. Uh, yeah, thank you. I forgot to put insurance on there. Um, so yeah, that's. Uh, do you want to open it up, or do you want Shoot, to... Shoot, I'm just going to go through this last step. Um, this is, that's, that's your beginning steps. We basically walked you through all the really hard stuff, and I'm sorry if it, it broke you your dreams. It's very expensive and takes a lot of time. But we are proof that it is doable, because we did it. We thought we had so much money to start with, and it got drained instantly with all these permits and rent and stuff. Um, honestly, our story is that we just applied for credit cards, and loans, and that's how Crossroads is built, was credit cards. I could apply it until I, I wasn't accepted anymore. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we're still paying back those credit cards today, but eventually they all get paid off and um, we'll be growing. Um, the last couple things I have down here are just some great resources for you to have. These are people that maybe I've worked with in the past on <coughs> other projects, or we even like hired to help us with our escape room. Um, if you want tech in your game, there's an easy solution with Sprite Props. Uh, it's a very user-friendly way to get like maglocks to work. Um, are they or, here? I didn't even make my rounds. No, I don't here. They're not here. And then um, <laughs> Arduinos are, if you're not familiar with it, that's basically the way that you can program things to do exactly what you want. I'll press this button, this button, this button, this button, and that makes this door open type of thing. Arduinos are super fun. <laughs> if you like this kind of stuff, it's just a fun little hobby to have. Uh, but honestly, I think Fright Props has a lot of equipment that you can probably do the things that you want to do with their stuff. So, but I suggest <coughs> Arduino because it's fun and you can do awesome stuff with it. And they have a starter kit that's ninety dollars, and they have like a step-by-step -step instruction sheet. Instruction sheet. Um, plan on you know spending a lot of time really understanding that if you're not really into currents and stuff like that. I know it took a, a long time for me. But it, it gives you a good understanding, and then you can start creating things yourself from there. That's my alarm. Um, Seeing painting, painting makes so much of a difference. Stay a painter. If if you are not a painter, don't try and paint things. Uh, you can tell. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lots uh, of painters out there. There are so many. Painters. I I have so many you know. painter friends here who would love to paint your escape room. Use them, please. It will make such a difference. Um, and then also sound in escape rooms, I think is commonly missed. Please use a sound designer. Um, lighting as well. Do you want to use practical lights, which is like lamps and things like that? Or do you want to use theatrical lights? You can use some birdies, you can get some interesting colors in there. Do you want your lights to flicker? Do you want them to, to throb? Do you want them to turn off at some points? These are definitely questions you should, you should think about. Um, same with um, set dressing. My favorite thing to do with our sets is we get a lot of props from Goodwill that we like redesign. And like, like our lobby table is a desk that I found from Goodwill that we chopped in half and like spread apart and then put a piece of wood <laughs> on to make it the size we needed. Like that's how you get through, especially if you don't have a lot of money. That's the key. That's awesome. uh, <laughs> um, but be aware that if you get something from um, like Goodwill or something and it breaks on you, it's going to be really hard to find a duplicate. So if there's any like important prop in your game, you need to get it from a, a place that will always have that. So most of our important props are on Amazon. It's really easy to be like, oh, this broke. We'll just reorder another one instead of going to the store and all that. Uh, and then videos you saw, our video. I have to say that video has helped us gain so many people. So many people come and play because they see that video and they know what they're getting into and it looks really exciting. Um, it is definitely worth investing in getting a video for your game and showing people what it's like. Uh, and then last is just a little bit of escape room etiquette. Please don't do any of these things in your game because then we get people who come in who don't know how to do an escape room. Like this is totally new to them. And they'll do really weird, stupid stuff. 
Oh my gosh, we didn't bring that lock that broke. No, we didn't. Oh, dang. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yes, we have we had yeah, a lock. You can lock go by our booth. I'll show you. It's, oh, a, it's, it's a metal lock. latch. Yeah, it's a metal latch, and um, it's just our example of being like, please don't put like glass and stuff or shrimp in your escape room because it will break. But we're like, metal, wood, you can't break that stuff. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you can't break that stuff. We have a metal latch that someone was, I guess they're like, I don't want to solve this. So they took the lock and they used it to just force their way through it. And they totally twisted this thing 90 degrees to where it caused the screws to like rip out of the wood. And that's how they got in twice. They did this twice. That's a full the loop of the lock clean out of the lock. Yeah. Um, what the heck? I'm going out. I've gone in and seen the doorknobs missing. Yes. Yes, doorknobs get ripped off all the time. Uh, you would think a doorknob is something that's sturdy yeah. that we use all the time. You're like, people know how to operate this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I've never opened a door like that in my life, but everybody seems to think that's how they work in escape rooms. So. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we'll, we'll get to your questions right now. Um, the research here. These games are games that we highly recommend playing. They might be bad games, they might be great games, they might be average games, but each of these games has something in it that we think is really valuable to learn from, whether they did it really well, or they did it really bad, or they had some kind of unique thing to it. Um, that's just what we want to promote, is make yours unique, and these people, all these people on here have something very interesting about them. So play as many escape rooms as you possibly can. <laughs> We've learned so much by playing ours, and we continue to do so. Whether it's something you like or don't like, you, you can take from it. Yes. Uh, stay away from what's out there. Uh, I we play a lot of rooms, and you go into a room, and it's all the same puzzles. You've done all of these, and it just you know come up with something unique and creative. And playing a lot of games is going to help you do that. Again, this is not a list of our favorite games. Um, <laughs> this is a list that you can learn from, and we recommend that you go and play these to learn all sorts of lessons. Uh, good and bad. <laughs> and this very last thing, we are continuing this talk at Scare Lane next week on Sunday, um, exactly a week from today. We're going to be talking now that hopefully you have all your permits, you're doing good, but you want to talk about like game design, operating things, marketing things, that's what we'll be touching on at Scare Lane. So a little bit more fun talk, where this will yeah, be a little, a little, little rough. <laughs> oh. um, yes, so we'll open this up to just like questions, answers, if you guys have any. Go ahead. How much research did you do beforehand to determine what your budget was to even start? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. So with us personally, we um, we were saving up for a house for a really long time. Uh, and we found escape rooms and we loved it. And we're like, well, we're just going to use our savings to put into this. So we did the math of like what we want to pay for rent, you know, just what our expenses were that we thought. And we're like, we can do this. And then we went into the whole permitting nightmare. And these were things that we didn't expect. We, we weren't aware that these things existed. Because my parents have opened businesses, but they've been like delis and stuff. And they have, the um, cities have like a sheet of paper for you to fill out. You can get your business license the same day. That, that's not the case for escape rooms. So we were caught off guard. Um, knowing what we know now, we may not have ever opened an escape room because we definitely were not prepared, which is why we're in so much debt because of it. But when you get to that point where you're just, you just have to keep throwing money at the problem, otherwise you're just out. I think the this. answer is there's uh, never enough research. Just keep researching all the time, um, especially for this because it is unpredictable, especially when you get to the permitting area. Because you don't know how much longer you're going to spend no. paying on rent when, you know, something can go through. Uh, we actually hired an ex-mayor to uh, fight for us at the city who knew a lot of loopholes. True story. And he was very expensive, but it saved us a lot of time. That was the question I was going to ask. Is there any consultants or just people that you know like this? There guy? are. Like this guy, he, um, he's retired now. That's why his name's on, on the paper. I'm sorry. Um, but our broker actually recommended him to us because our broker wanted our lease to go through because then he gets all the money. Um, but yeah, definitely research if you need it. It's really good having someone there to fight for you. If you become good friends with your architect, having him there for all these city meetings is huge. Uh, ours cost a lot of money to get him there for the meetings, but when we did have those, we actually got to move forward. Whereas if it's just us, they'll just like 
belittle you and they'll just talk city speak and you don't understand what they're saying. It is a whole other language than, than this. It, having someone who knows the language. Uh, it's great. So yeah. They'll have their own little jargon in the corner and then things get done. Uh, anything else that we can have? Yes, uh, earlier you said in square footage, bigger is better, and you also mentioned that your place is 3,000 square feet. What, like, can you give us some idea, like with the maze rooms today, it seems like people are expecting larger, larger rooms, yes. where before, the earlier ones were like two, it's like 300 square feet, but now they're getting like 450. Mm -hmm. Are they even getting to like 600 square feet? Well, there's one place at Quest, Factory things that they're called now. They have one. You might build them. It's like a thousand square foot room. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple really large ones in this area, and then the one in Baton Rouge are, is really, really large too. Are, it's like eight or nine rooms within the game. Yeah, our rooms are on the like, larger side. Um, it depends on how many people you want to put in. Um, I know that there's some escape rooms who. Uh, they made a smaller game and now they're regretting it because they have to spend just as much money on staff working a game that they can only get like maybe three or four people in. Um, or if you make a larger game then you can get more people in. But then your game design has to change too. It has to be able to allow that many people to be occupied and busy yes. during that time. Uh, don't make a gigantic room just because that's what you think it should be done. Whatever size room is going to accommodate your idea is what, how big your room. Uh, I've actually played a really great game that was really, really small, and it's one of my favorites of all time. Um, is it the one? Yes. Uh, it's a great game, and it's tiny. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, so size depends on your idea. Yeah. I was just trying to get an idea of, like, when you're looking for a location and you're trying to figure out what you're paying for square foot, mm -hmm. like, you know, I, the data is so different. Some people are saying 1,200 square feet. Now can only do one room. Yeah, and it, it's uh, it's totally up to you. Yeah. Our, our recommendation with going bigger is just because this process is so horrible. If you have a space that can host, you know, five or six games, you don't have to go through this again. You can just keep putting your ideas in that space, and I think that will save you a lot of time. Yeah. I have you found that um, that this game is more of a destination? Or something? They were. I think that's changing now. There's a lot of escape rooms opening up in like strip malls and stuff, and I think it's really becoming more of like uh, an arcade type of thing. Like you see it, so it reminds you to go do that. Right. What are your thoughts on uh, mobile escape rooms? I think they're great. Um, I wouldn't do one personally just because I I work with them a lot. Like we have events in our space, but I don't know. Um, how they can actively continue getting customers. And I think that's a big problem they have is like, you don't know what their hours are or, or what's going on. Um, having a location that people can go to and ask for information at. Like we have people just walking all the time just saying like, what is this? I think it's really beneficial. And just having a space to send people. Whereas the mobile game, you have to go to new locations and you haven't done the advertising necessary to get those people to come yet. Uh, Escape Bus is here. Anybody yeah. play Escape Bus today? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's good. So, uh, I don't know if they have more time slots available, but they are here. You can check them out uh, for, for mobile games. Uh, yeah. I saw one over here. I'm sorry. Okay. You mentioned that Irvine has a special class for mm -hmm. uh, the friend zoning. What, in other locations, what typical zoning does it fall under? You know, what type of. Um, I have no idea. It doesn't I, exist. Yeah. It Escape does. rooms, for the most part, in cities aren't a thing. So when you come to them and you say, I want to do an escape room, they have they don't have a legal jargon, they don't have their language to accommodate that idea. Which is why we said uh, explain it like a class so it sort of makes a little bit more sense and they can kind of understand where you're what you're doing. Uh, Irvine got escape rooms saying, hey we want to open and they said, okay, well what is it? And they you know they come, they play. And so Irvine said, okay, it's a class type of room. Here's the formula for it. You have to comply to this structure, and you are an escape room in Earth. Mm -hmm. But I I think they're the only city that's done something I know like that. Yeah, so, that's why there's so many yeah. right there. Hmm. Yes? Once you built your space, how did you end up attracting people to your place? Advertising. 
I mean, we have, luckily we do have, um, the street we're on is La Palma, there's a lot of stuff there, there's like the castle park, and then there's the trampoline place, and there's actually a few other escape rooms on that strip, so it seems like a tucked away industrial zone, but it's actually highly traveled, so we put up big signs, which was helpful in the beginning, um, Facebook ads, Google ads, I say avoid Yelp completely, that's a total waste of money, um, that's where we put a lot of stuff in, even just like contacting colleges, and saying like, you know, maybe college student discount, anywhere and everywhere. Going to things like this, like we have a booth at this. Uh, one thing that I, I really like about the SoCal community, which seems pretty unique in the escape room world, is that it's a pretty friendly, pretty welcoming group of people. We all have like a lot of theater people who are like, yeah, go see that show, go see that show. Uh, so we have, uh, at our place, we have flyers for games that we personally like a lot, and we like recommending, after our guests have played our games, we like recommending those games, uh, and those games will recommend us after they've played their games. Uh, because they like what we've done. And so just being a part of the SoCal escape room community and hooking up with people who really love your games and helping cross promote is also a lot of very good. Um, you, you find like Groupon and those things? Um, we haven't done Groupon. Um, I know a few escape rooms have. Uh, I think Groupon could be beneficial if you have two games. Uh, because maybe only one of them is a discount. So people play and they're like, this is great, and they come and do the other one at full price. The issue is a lot of people just have one game and they have the group on it, and I don't know how that makes a whole lot of sense. To be aware though, group on, they'll ask you to charge half price for your tickets. So you're, say your ticket's $30, the people buy it for 15, and then group on will usually take around 30 to 50% of that 15, so you're making maybe $7 a ticket now. So it's you're really doing it just to get people in and hoping that they'll come back for your other game. We've never done it. I think that sounds like a horrible strategy. Rather people just play the game and then they recommend it to their friends and more people just come. Uh, but some people, they think it's a, a good idea and I guess it's working for them. And you can control how many tickets are purchased mm -hmm. on Groupon. So uh, again, it's more of an individual Situation. My problem is I also feel like it devalues escape rooms. Someone mm -hmm. plays this one escape room for $15 and they think like, that was awesome, this is what I get for 15 So when they play mm -hmm. another escape room or maybe the second one at that location and they pay double the price now and it's not double the experience, it, it just, you hurt yourself. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. I, I just have a question you may not have the answer for, but I have noticed when I look at Los Angeles and cities in general, the escape rooms tend to be clumped together, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're all in Hollywood, they're in Anaheim, there's some starting out now in Tarzana, and they're all come together. And I know some of that is because people are franchising. I mean, 60 Out has five, yeah. and Maze Rooms has seven and all that. But do you see an advantage for that clumping, or do you see a disadvantage if you were to like open one in Pasadena? A lot of that clumping has to do with what's kind of happened during Irvine. Yeah. where the city came up with a formula. So uh, there's the Sky Circle in yeah. Irvine has <laughs> how many? Like six, six or seven, seven. companies. Oh, there's there's more. more. No? Yeah, there's, no more. there's like 15. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, when I say Sky Circle, it is a circle. This street <laughs> can fit in this building. Um, that all the, It's the same business park that all of these companies are in. And it has to do with where you can open yeah. and what you will locations say that. you can find. I think that's where the clumping comes from. I don't know that escape rooms really want to be next to each other. It's just that they're being forced to be next to each other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have like a two, not two part question, but kind of two questions. Uh, first question is how often do you like kind of see, I know that the Crossroads tends not to have kind of turned over for their uh, escape rooms. Uh, do you think it's a good idea to kind of one like yearly change over rooms or? Um, it's uh, it's up to you. Um, we've actually we've changed the Hexroom quite a few times, and I have to say that's mostly because Hexroom is like our baby, and we're never done with it. Like we just we keep having really cool ideas, and we're like, well, let's just add that this week, and we just throw it in there, and it, it's terrible. And it takes a lot of time. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's up to you. I think it's really fun to keep doing it, but then it's also delayed us on opening up a third game. 
I think it's important to know when your game has become outdated and then when it needs to go up. Like we have had a few critiques happen with like our fun house game is that it has too many locks in it. At the time, that's what was expected of escape rooms and it was you know on par with everything that was happening. But now that you know more tech has been added to escape rooms, like okay, we're going to need to come around to that one and give it a revamp. Uh, but it's also about focusing your energy. Like right now, ours is on our third game. So then once that's done, we might come back and, and fix up our other ones. Uh, I'm under the personal opinion that a room can last around five years, uh, and especially if you're keeping updating it, and the same idea, same kind of thing. Um, updating the puzzles. So I right, guess the answer is like not changing the theme thing. entirely, right. it's not necessary, but just keeping it up to date tech-wise. I feel like you can keep a room around for at least five years, and you'll still get people coming in. Um, and also, you're getting new customers who, you know, five years ago they were in middle school, or high school. So I know there's a there is a, a general fear that people, you know, I have to replace this entire room after this year because people don't want to do it. There's a lot of people. Yeah, I think out there. Of money. There's a good 20 million people around this area. <laughs> the odds that you get to them all very likely. Okay, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Sure. Guys, uh, yeah, could you just give me an idea, like a ballpark, I don't want to get into specifics obviously, but like a realistic startup cost in like your general... A million dollars. Yeah, yeah I can't do that because <laughs> yeah, it's so be different. Great. It yeah. depends on if your space you're opening is only 500 square feet or if you're thinking about opening something that's like, you know, 1,500 square feet and, and on. Um, and then like we said, the permitting and the city that you're dealing right. with. Yeah, it's going to fluctuate wide. Like, do so you yeah. need a CUP? Because that could be 3000 to 25000 it, yeah. It's impossible to tell you. Yeah. Yes? So how do you feel on the idea of, let's say, a shorter escape room on top of, like, say, <coughs> say a 15-minute escape room? Because, um, I mean, we've been to Hex Room. Um, just naturally, the understanding is you guys have had people walk in and, you know, you explain what it is, and they come back and make a reservation another day. Um, you know, just do the foot traffic. Uh, what do you think of, like, let's say, a shorter escape room where it's more higher availability, higher turnover? Um, that's up to you. You have, um, say, this smaller room only hosts two people, and it's a 15 minute room, it has a five minute reset. Sure. So now that's taking 20 minutes out of an hour, and you got two people in, and then you can do two more after that for the hour, so you get six people in for that one hour, and you've had a game master after reset three times. Sure. That, that's your max, is six people. Oh, no, but or I mean, you can not. have a, a larger game that takes the full hour, but you can get 10 people in there. So it's more of like a business strategy of um, where you want to invest your money in. Yeah, I get it. Um, but uh, my question is not that that would be your only puzzle. So, I mean, like to have multiple puzzles, like maybe a, a precursor lead in, and then mm -hmm. you know something. Uh, we have a game. fun puzzle in our oh. lounge area next to our lobby. Okay. Uh, sometimes we'll have people do that. It's just a jar of candy, and you solve one puzzle, and you okay. get a jar of candy, and people love it, and yeah. um, that's fun. <laughs> yeah, cool. I don't know if it's worth investing on an entire space sure. or oh, just yeah, yeah. that one like little group because you also have to have a staff member monitoring that. No, yeah, so, yeah. Other people have like, puzzle boxes. Do you have to give them mm -hmm. to? It's, and it's three thirty, but I'm gonna put one more in if someone has a burning oh, yeah. question. Burning. burning question. It has to be burning though. It has to be on fire. <laughs> okay. When are you open your room, the room? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fall. Fun. We're saying fall. Oh, we don't. We're not gonna set an, oh. a deadline. <laughs> then we rush and it's not perfect. So we're experimenting with a very complex design, so yeah. Are 